Hello and welcome to the Clinical Care Options Infectious Disease Podcast. I'm your host, Zachary Schwartz. Today I'm joined once again by Dr. Camille Cotton from Harvard Medical School and Dr. Atul Humar, University of Toronto. In this episode, they take us through a series of case studies on CMV infection. They'll explore how to design antiviral regimens that will minimize antiviral toxicities and maximize efficacy. To follow along with the slides, visit the links in the show notes. Now let's get started with Dr. Cotton. The first case is a 64-year-old woman who had thin basement uh, membrane disease who underwent kidney transplant from a deceased donor, donor positive, recipient negative for CMV, of course. The surgery was complicated by thrombotic microangiopathy from tacrolimus, so she was converted to bilatisept, prednisone, and azathioprine. She didn't tolerate mycophenolate either. So already you're kind of thinking, oh, D plus R minus bilatisept, okay? So six months of valgancyclovir as per institutional protocol, and one month after the valgancyclovir prophylaxis ended, she was on surveillance after prophylaxis, so we, were moni- we knew that this was a high-risk situation, so we were monitoring her weekly. She developed CMV. Her initial CMV DNA emia was uh, just over 10,000 IU per mil. She was started on uh, valgancyclovir treatment at 450 milligrams twice a day. Week one, her DNA emia went from 10,000 up to 22,000. You know, it's not even half a log difference, but still it um, goes up at one week, just like I said, commonly happens, no drama. By the second week, she's down to 17,000. Okay, kind of wish it was a little lower than that, but nonetheless, uh, you know, um, anyway. And the following week, she's down to 1,677, so great then 261, and then undetectable, and we switch her to prophylaxis. Okay, so like a pretty good story overall, although you are kind of thinking, well, D plus R minus and bilatisept, and she's presenting this case, right? So she's on prophylaxis, and while on prophylaxis, she has breakthrough CMV DNA emia at 18,000 IU per mil on plasma. So what would you do at this point? Would you start meribavir? Would you start foscarnet? Would you start latamavir? Would you start higher dose valgancyclovir treatment? Would you start intravenous scancyclovir treatment? Or would you wait for resistance testing to return in like one to two weeks? So I think I wouldn't wait for resistance testing because it's already 18,000 going in the wrong direction. That's a pretty significant DNA emia, so going in the wrong direction. I personally would not switch to high dose um, valgancyclovir because it's not going to work. And it almost never works. It just, there's usually a resistance mutation that's a high level resistance mutation. And almost undoubtedly, things will get worse while you're waiting for resistance testing. So I actually would switch to either Marubavir or Foscarnet. Okay, so here's the algorithm from the guidelines. I will say every, this is the fourth version of the guidelines. Every time we publish, this is the most popular figure in the guidelines. So there it is. So one, you identify that there are risk factors and that the patient likely has refractory resistant disease. Two, you optimize the immunosuppression. You review the drug dosing. You order the resistance testing. If it's a high viral load, then you may wish to use foscarnet or meribavir. And I actually think 18,000 is a pretty reason getting higher viral load. So I probably would go down the foscarnet or meribavir arm. If it's not high, then you could do intravenous gencyclovir, valgencyclovir at higher dose or meribavir. And then important to realize that you don't want to use meribavir if there's CNS disease or retinitis. So you always want to screen for that. Those are pretty rare, but nonetheless, they, meribavir does not penetrate into those spaces. And then foscarnet in the guidelines, foscarnet is suggested for high viral loads, usually greater than 50,000. Meribavir tends to work better and have lower, we believe, probably lower rates of resistance developing if there's a lower viral load to start. And then once you have the genotypic testing, you sort of go through the algorithm, and depending on the results, you go through and you pick the best therapeutic options. And depending on how the information you get looks, sometimes I just get the resistance mutation, so I have to actually find in the document, in the guidelines document, I actually find the mutation and look at how resistant it is to various antivirals, et cetera. So you just kind of walk through through the algorithm. Okay, so there she is, 18,000 and this was clearly breakthrough, undoubtedly pretty resistant to valgancyclovir. We couldn't get meribavir quickly for her, so we actually admitted her to hospital, put her on foscarnet induction. She was found to have the UL97 mutation, the M460V, which is one of the top common canonical mutations. We also switched the bilatisept to cyclosporin, 
She's had a, she has a good response to the phosphocarnet induction. And in the guidelines meeting, we actually talked a lot about maybe, you know, induction with phosphocarnet followed by consolidation with meribavir, not prophylaxis, but sort of starting, just really getting that DNA emia down and then consolidating with meribavir. And because there can be delays in access due to insurance, although the company has a very good program, but still sometimes there can be delays. Sometimes phosphocarnet can give you the initial treatment option. I personally always keep people in hospital for phosphocarnet. I never send anyone home on phosphocarnet, and I actually have very good outcomes when it's very carefully used. I then switched the phosphocarnet to meribavir and famcyclovir, remembering that meribavir just covers CMV. It doesn't cover HSV, VZV. And so I always think of using it as a combination pill. If somebody has resistant refractory CMV, they could be at risk for disseminated zoster. And she went home and did very well. She had a very low DNA emia, and eventually, after a full course of treatment, we switched her to latemavir for a full six months of, at this point, secondary prophylaxis. And after we stopped the latemavir, she had a little blip of CMV, at like 816 IU per mil. And we were really worried. That's very low, but we were worried given the overall context, and this is a very complicated patient who had not tolerated her immunosuppression and had a lot of things go on. So the team was quite worried. I didn't think we needed to restart meribavir, but we did give a one-time dose of CMV immunoglobulin, and then she subsequently resolved her CMV DNA emia and sailed off into the sunset and has done quite well. So overall, a case where we've used multiple different agents, we used the resistance testing, and the strongest risk factor for her, I think, was the bolatocept treatment. And so really, I, I can almost smell the bolatocept in the EPIC chart or the EMR. When I get this complex case, I'm like, this patient's on bolatocept. Always look for it. Sometimes it's not so obvious or not highlighted. So I think where possible, switch to another immunosuppressive agent while they're on the CMV treatment. Here's an example of the guidelines. I got the information that it was the M460V mutation. And I found it in the chart, so that's a very high level eclavir resistance mutation. It results in an EC50 of 5 to 15 fold higher. So I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to hit that with Balgan cyclovir or intravenous GAN cyclovir. So I really do need a different agent. And then one of the cool things that I found out during the guidelines meeting is that this M460V or I mutation actually makes people exquisitely sensitive to meribavir. And overall, in the solstice trial, they had a statistically better response rate to meribavir compared to other gencyclovir resistance mutations. So that's kind of cool. One little good thing, right, out of all of this. Okay, and now I'll let Atul present his case. Okay, so this is a lung transplant patient, D plus R minus, 10, 10 months post lung transplant. So same situation, he's on valgencyclovir prophylaxis at the time this happens. See, but he's frequently an on and off valgencyclovir because of leukopenia. Has a two-week history of fever, fatigue, malaise, and creatinine's mildly elevated at 164 or 1.85, and white counts 2.9. His CMV viral load is 35,500 IU per ml. So what treatment would you switch to at this point? IV gencyclovir, higher dose oral valgencyclovir, foscarnet, meribavir or other. We actually switched this patient initially uh, to IV gancyclovir. What happened is there was no clinical improvement. If a patient's on valgancyclovir and taking it at a prophylactic dose and they break through with a high viral load, a lot of those patients have true gancyclovir resistance. So if they present unwell with a high viral load, you have to be careful about using IV gancyclovir in that setting and you should consider an alternative. But in this patient, we did use IV gancyclovir, and the viral load went up to 62,000, and the patient did indeed have a very common CMV gancyclovir resistance mutation L595S, which also confers high-level gancyclovir resistance. So at this point, what would you switch the patient to? Would you increase the dose of gancyclovir, so double dose? Would you give foscarnet? Would you give meribavir or would you do other? We would typically use foscarnet in that setting as well for that high of a viral load and the patient is clinically unwell, although the renal function is abnormal, so you do need to be quite cautious. This patient indeed was started on foscarnet and the viral load did decrease to undetectable, but what happened is the renal function worsened and so the foscarnet had to be prematurely stopped 
and then shortly after that, the viral load rebounded, but this time to approximately 10,000 IU per ml. So what do you do now? Restart foscarnet, high-dose gancyclovir, meribavir, latermavir, or other. I think this is a really good setting to use meribavir in. So you know there's a gancyclovir resistance mutation, the viral load is not terribly high, and the patient also has renal dysfunction there. So all kind of compelling reasons to use meribavir in this setting. And that's what we did. We also decided to give the patient CMV immune globulin for three doses as well. And the patient had a nice viral load response. And then for secondary prophylaxis, this patient was placed on latermavir for three months and did well. Camille, why don't you join me up here and I'll lead the question and answer. So in summary, we hope you enjoyed this. I think it's a pretty exciting time to be in the CMB field. We're entering a new era where multiple diagnostic, therapeutics, and preventive strategies are being deployed. And I think we're making good progress. So thank you very much. And we'll do some questions. Great. So one of the first questions I think is a pretty straightforward one, but is if CMV viremia worsens after starting treatment, from what time point should you count two weeks to determine refractory CMV? Is it the baseline or is it the peak value? And um, I usually say it's from the time that we initiated treatment. Yeah. Okay, so it's two weeks from the initiation of treatment. The peak is a migratory thing. You don't know when the peak's gonna happen, so it's sort of two weeks from the onset of treatment. Okay, so the next question. So in, when you're treating patients with CMV, I think we both said you could treat uh, either to negative or you could aim for a center-specific threshold. So what does your center, Camille, consider as that threshold to aim for if it's not uh, zero? Yeah, I often think, so we test on plasma. One of the big issues, if, if you're using a whole blood assay, and it can actually be hard to tell, like you have to look pretty hard sometimes in the computer, whole blood tends to give a higher overall result. So with whole blood, you may not get to negative. So you, you may treat for, you could treat for months, but you may not achieve negative. It is a latent virus, it's still in the body, you may still detect it. So that's an important branch point for me is if it's whole blood, I'll, I'll accept a higher number than if it's plasma. But usually when it's below 200, I'm a lot less worried. I'm a lot less worried about CMV. So I will often take that as, if it's, so if it's double digits or below 200, I'm often like, yeah, we've treated well enough, the body will mop up the rest. I think that many people keep treating for weeks, trying to get the 152 down to you know 78. Like it, that's not really necessary. In the guidelines, we talk a lot about what is a clinically significant change, and we recommend thinking about it in log, and then that it should be a 0.7 log base 10 change when it's especially when the it's below up 1,000. So a lot of those numbers are sort of like the same number actually using real time PCR. And so I think don't over-treat. I think we do end up over-treating and then the patients, it's expensive, and then they can get the cytopenias, especially leukopenia from the valgancyclovir. What do you think? I'd love talking to you about this question. Yeah, I think this is one of the most common traps that people fall into, is trying to get the viral load down to zero. And it's, it's just not possible in many patients. And so at our own institution, we use a threshold of 200 IU per ml in plasma. And anything below that, we just call negative, actually. And uh, we asked the lab, we actually asked the lab to report those as less than 200 and not quantify those. And I think if you do something like that, if you can set a center-specific threshold, it will help you immensely in interpretation of these ultra-low viral loads. People are trying to treat 50 IU per ml, 35 IU per ml, and they're wondering if they should start meribavir at 75 IU per ml and things like that. And what happens if, with these grumbling little low-level viremias is many patients will then develop immunity. They'll develop a cellular immune response over time, and they'll actually be able to eliminate that low level of viral load. Although not all patients, some will obviously recur, but, but many patients will. Often when I have those low-level results, I may stop therapy, but I might do some surveillance after treatment. So then I start doing, especially if it's somebody that I think is high risk for a variety of factors, I'll just start doing weekly monitoring and make sure I don't miss the opportunity to treat them at a low level. But I tend to be shorter, I actually think I tend to be shorter on treatment. And I love what he said about his laboratory and how he asked them to report less than 200 as negative. I asked my laboratory if they'd do that and they said no. <laughs> Life's better in Canada, I guess. Um, this is a common question that gets asked, is checking CMV in BAL fluid in the ICU patients. 
Yeah, so we covered this in the definitions, uh, the CMV definitions, and actually it turns out I was the one in that definitions group that surveyed the, all these lung transplant programs, including his program in Toronto and my program at Mass General and Duke and multiple other big lung transplant programs. And it turns out that CMV PCR on BAL is generally really not useful. The higher the number, the more likely they have pneumonitis. But honestly, it BAL is by definition lavage, right? So it depends on how much fluid is put in. We get a lot of numbers, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 3rd, all kinds of things. But if it's really high, you can diagnose pneumonitis that way, but otherwise it's really not useful. And what I found out in my survey is that most of these big transplant programs don't test. Many, so that is actually really helpful. So we largely have stopped doing, I've stopped recommending doing BAL CMV PCRs. That's really, it's a clinical diagnosis. You know it when you see it. The patient has pneumonitis, they often have a significant CMV DNA emia, but also people will shed CMV. And so you don't want to treat all these people that are just shedding because they're in the intensive care unit. So in general, we're refraining from sending that. Yeah. Yeah, we had to, we were doing it and eventually we had to ask the lab to stop doing it because we just didn't know how to interpret all these positive results that we were getting. So I think it's better to just rely on the peripheral viral load and the clinical picture. In the vast majority of settings, there might be some extenuating clinical circumstances where you may specifically want that test. Well, thank you to Dr. Cotton and Dr. Humar and many thanks to our listeners for joining us. To learn more about navigating complex refractory CMV cases, visit the link in the show notes. And to get access to all of our new podcasts, subscribe to the CCO Infectious Disease Podcast on your favorite player. Thank you, and we'll see you on the next podcast soon.